Colorectal cancer is one of the most common types of cancer in the U.S. for both men and women. The American Cancer Society estimates that this year alone, over 150,000 people will be diagnosed with the disease and that 50,000 will die from complications. Meanwhile, cases of colorectal cancer are on the rise for people under the age of 50. And younger people are often diagnosed with more advanced stages of the cancer due to delays in detection. Now, this is what happened to one Minnesota woman, Mandy Wilk. Her story began when she was 35. Eight years and multiple organ transplants later, the 42-year-old is now cancer-free. We'll hear from Mandy in just a moment. But first, we are joined by one of her physicians, Dr. Katherine Myers. She's a lung transplant pulmonologist at the Northwestern Medicine Canning Thoracic Institute. Welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. So as I just mentioned, doctor, you're a lung transplant pulmonologist, but we're, we're talking about colorectal cancer. So I want you to help us with that connection. What should we know? Sure. So the most common site of cancer metastasis, or that is cancer going to another organ, is the lungs. Your entire blood volume um, goes through your lungs every day, multiple times a day, in order to get oxygen, right, from the environment. And so we see that colon cancer, breast cancer, almost every cancer you can think of um, can and will often go to the lungs if it's um, left to time. And so in Mandy's case, she did eventually develop colon cancer in her lungs, and that's sort of how I got involved as a pulmonologist. Mm. Yeah, according to Johns Hopkins Medicine, lung cancer patients, they're usually not eligible for lung transplants. Is that right? Correct. Why? You so whenever we transplant patients, we are trying to make sure that they can live as long as possible after the surgery. And so generally, if you have any life-limiting illnesses, you um, are not considered for transplant. But additionally, um, transplant patients receive a lot of immunosuppression. Immunosuppression can actually cause cancers to grow more quickly because your immune system can't fight the cancer. And so one of the reasons cancer patients are often not candidates for transplant is because of that immunosuppression and, and the risk of recurrence. Mm. We've been hearing that people are getting cancer younger. That's something that we've reported on the show recently as well. But, but why do so many young people get overlooked when it comes to detecting their cancers? So because it's not the classic patient population, and oftentimes many of our um, screening algorithms do not include younger patients. So colorectal cancer screening, for example, doesn't start usually until earliest 45, depending upon family history. And so patients in their 30s and 40s oftentimes are not receiving regular colonoscopies mm -hmm. in order to roll out these um, low-grade early cancers, which is one of the number one factors in decreasing col colorectal cancer cases yeah. and deaths in this country. Um, so because they're not part of that screening algorithm, uh, oftentimes the cases can be missed until they're very advanced. Yeah, I mentioned that earlier. They're often diagnosed with more advanced stages of cancer. So we're going to bring in Mandy here in just a moment. Uh, she was a part of Northwestern's Double Lung Replacement and Multidisciplinary Care, or DREAM, program. Talk about the need for a program like this, doctor. So as you said, right now, many lung cancer patients and cancer patients in general are um, not candidates for lung transplant and often other organ transplants. And so this registry is um, a patient registry where we're actually looking at transplant in this specific patient population because some of our hesitancy in transplanting this, these patients is theoretical. Um, and so we don't really know how patients might do after transplant mm -hmm. in some of these cases. And so we're looking at patients with select types and stages of lung cancer, um, but also patients who have other types of cancer, such as Mandy's case, colorectal cancer, that have spread to the lung. Um, and trying to see if this is a viable treatment option when other courses of therapy and um, standard chemo and surgery have failed. That's Dr. Katherine Myers, who's one of Mandy Wilkes' doctors and lung transplant pulmonologist at the Northwestern Medicine Canning Thoracic Institute. Thank you so much for that breakdown. Of course. Thank you. I want to bring Mandy into the conversation. Hey, Mandy, thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for having me. So Mandy Wilk is a survivor of colorectal cancer and recipient of a life-saving double lung transplant surgery. 
My goodness. Amazing. Amazing. Right? We'll get into your incredible story. It begins in 2017. I wonder how everything was leading up to your diagnosis, because I understand this kind of came out of nowhere. For me, it came out of nowhere, for sure. Um, prior to the diagnosis, I was completely active. I um, I'm a long distance runner, so I was running miles and miles a day, um, led a really healthy lifestyle, working full time. And uh, one one day we had spaghetti for dinner, I remember, and I, I got really sick and I thought, oh, I have like food poisoning. And a couple of days later, I still felt these like sharp pains in my abdomen. And so that led to me going to urgent care, being seen by my uh, regular physician, ultimately having a CT scan and then a colonoscopy. Mm. You go to emergency care, you meet with doctors, you get a CT scan. I mean, so how long did that take? So up until the colonoscopy, I would say that probably took about a month and a half. And when the doctor suggested we that I have a colonoscopy because I, I was so young, I was 34 at the time, um, he said, you know, we'll schedule that in about three months. It's about a three-month wait to get you in. And I just had this really kind of sick feeling in my stomach that said, like, you can't, you shouldn't wait that long. Mm. Um, so I I had said, you know, if you can't get me in sooner, then I, I'll find somewhere else to go. And then magically appointment became available within like maybe a week or two. And that's after having that colonoscopy, the doctor quite literally came into the room and said, I, I never saw this coming. Mm. And that's how I found out that I had stage four cancer. What was going through your mind at that point? I was, I was thinking like, first of all, if I hadn't advocated for myself to have this colonoscopy two months before they said I should, uh, what would have happened? And, and then I was, I was just really shocked because I, I was so healthy and I had zero inclination that anything was wrong. I'm thinking of the words stage four cancer. When you hear oh. that in your 30s, what are you thinking? Because I know what we all think when we hear stage four cancer. Right. So I I was thinking, and it's probably one of the stages of denial, but I was just thinking, like, I will find a way to fix this. Yeah. Like, I will find a way out of this. Everything started happening really fast once they diagnosed me. It oh, was bet. like, we're going to start treatment and you, you know, everything's going to change. And, and so... So chemo starts? That's the next step? The next step was, like, once the insurance approval happens for all of that treatment, it was chemotherapy right away. Yes. How many rounds? So initially, I think we ended up doing like 15 to 17 rounds, which is... Wow. Typically, they do 12. The doctor that I had gone with, his his theory was, we're going to treat you until you really can't take it anymore, um, which was a detriment because it ended up hurting my liver more than it, it should have. But and, and do they mean just because chemo is so tough on the body from yes, what I hear? Yes. It was So till you physically could not take it anymore. Well, it was more like my body couldn't take it anymore. Like my blood counts were really low. And so when they're doing testing to see how things are going, they're adjusting medications based on like the blood work that they receive. And so after a certain point they like my body couldn't take any more chemo. I was still functioning. Like I'm this whole time working full time and like I have a life going, right? Really? But um, my body could not take it anymore. Working full time in what field? So I work um, as a curriculum. At that time I was a teacher, but I'm a curriculum and instruction specialist in Bloomington. All through these 15, 16 rounds. All of, through of all chemo. the last seven years. Yeah. And they tell you you have two to two and a half years to live. Mandy. My first oncologist told me that, yes. So that my first meeting prior to any chemotherapy was with an oncologist and a, a liver surgeon. And the oncologist um, said the prognosis is about two, two and a half years. And you you should just um, continue life and, you know, enjoy it. So take more vacations, do the things you want to do, because although we're going to treat you and we're going to use the... Um, the regimen that I was on was called 5-FU, so it's a very strong treatment of drugs. Okay. Um, although we're going to give you, like, all we have, like, realistically, you are stage 4 cancer. Like, there's going to be a limited amount of time you're terminal. Still, you are thinking what you told us earlier. You are optimistic, and you're saying to yourself, I'm going to figure this out. 
yeah, I think it was just determined. Like I'm determined to fi- like figure it out. And I know that that maybe is not realistic when you're given a diagnosis like that initially, but I just felt like I, I will figure it out. And just because I'm getting one prognosis from yeah. one doctor, I, I know that you can have a second Let opinion a second or a opinion. third opinion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What made you ultimately come to that decision to seek a different oncologist? So uh, I wasn't okay with the mindset that we're going to treat you with these 12 rounds. And then that's kind of the whole plan. And so even before treatment, I moved to a different oncologist. Um, and that oncologist, also their their facility worked with multiple hospitals. And so they had access to other clinical trials. So I just wanted, I wanted to make sure that the net was spread wide for any opportunity so that I was given the best shot. Mm -hmm. In 2020, you eventually get a liver transplant at U Chicago. Your brother, Adam, donated 60% of his liver, uh, but it wasn't as easy as just making an appointment. So talk about what it took to even get this transplant. So as I'm going through chemotherapy the first time, those first like 12 to 15 rounds, um, I had gone to multiple other hospitals across the country asking about a liver transplant. And I was told that at multiple hospitals that that wasn't an option. That's not something at that time that people were doing with the exception of one hospital um, in the United States. And so I also went to that particular hospital in the United States to meet with that doctor. Um, He wanted to wait till I I was a little bit further along um, and kind of exhausted all opportunities. Mm -hmm. I did come across a doctor in Houston that said, hey, I have some friends at UChicago that are thinking of piloting this program and they're about to start. Um, I'm originally from the suburbs of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so this was like kind of, I don't know, serendipitous that Mm. it just kind of worked out this way. So I contacted, she gave me the contacts for the doctors at U Chicago, mm-hmm. and I reached out to them and I said, um, Your chance to come back home for treatment. Yeah, I, I need help. And I heard that you were thinking of starting this program and I, I am going to be your best fit. Like I am going to do everything I can to make sure that I am successful and your program is successful. How do you feel after the liver transplant? So the liver transplant happened during the height of COVID. That was really challenging. Um, My brother, I have two brothers. I called them up. I said, I I need a transplant and they're considering me and I'm going to need a live donor. And both of my brothers, without any hesitation, were like, when do I start um, testing? Where do I sign up? Like without, without any hesitation. So I feel really lucky that I have two brothers that just love me so much. Um, So Adam, because he still lives in the suburbs here, we went with him and The transplant ended up happening on June 17th of 2020. He was doing great, like right afterwards. So I was, that was what I was most concerned about was his health. And Mm. like, I'm already terminally ill and, and I'm the one putting him at risk. So I was really worried about him. Um, He did really, really well. It was challenging because um, nobody could come to the surgery, like family and friends could not come. We could not have any visitors in the hospital. So that was, I think, the the hardest part for us. Um, but after after surgery, the recovery, like I had some complications, but beyond that, um, recovered really well. Uh, six months later, they find dots yes. all over your lungs. Yes. So the, I think it might have been the first CT that they did after surgery. It was about six months afterwards. And um, my pulmonologist called and said, you know, we... We found these METs all over your lungs, and they're not just like in one lung, they're in both of them. And so a lobectomy, is that, I think that's right, a lobectomy is not going to be possible where they take out just part of a a lung or they take out one entire lung um, because they're all over. Um, So the dots, just so I'm clear, like what did that mean? What what was that on your lungs? So um, the dots or the METs are like little spots or little tumors that are going to be growing and okay. they were all over. They and they did end up doing a biopsy of my lungs to verify that that's what that was what they were looking at and mm-hmm. and it did come back as it was part of the colorectal cancer that had spread to my lungs. 
So even after all those rounds of chemotherapy, the, the tumors on your lungs continue to grow. Correct. So what were your options at that point? So then um, we did 12 more rounds of chemotherapy. And then I was placed after that onto a maintenance chemo, which was a pill. I was on that maintenance chemo for a longer period of time until some of my CT scans showed that that maintenance pill mm. was no longer working effectively and the tumors were growing more rapidly. And then I went through another, I believe, 11 rounds of chemo. And this is where Northwestern's dream program that we talked about comes in, right? right? So my doctors at the University of Chicago had been monitoring me this entire time um, while I'm receiving chemotherapy in Minneapolis. And um, Dr. Pillai called me and she said, our tumor board has been reviewing your case. And we think that you would be a really great fit and candidate uh, as a patient for the DREAM program at Northwestern, which I had not yet heard about. And so she said, you know, I think you should reach out to them and just kind of get your name there and get your all of your scans, your information so that they can review everything to see if, if first of all, you are a candidate. Yeah. Was there, underneath all that uncertainty, a sense of relief, maybe, on your part? Or was it still I was just really confusion? Like, and I was like, I'm being saved twice, really. Like, I, yeah. I was given an amazing opportunity for a life-saving liver transplant. And now when, I, when I'm being told, like, we don't, you know, these tumors in January, I was told of this year, these tumors are getting bigger and the chemo is not working anymore. So we can't use that. And mm -hmm. the maintenance therapies are not working anymore. So we can't use that. Um, you're, we don't have any other options. This was really amazing that I was getting to hear like, Potentially, you could be a candidate for this this transplant. Incredible. Your brother uh, started a foundation in your name and has raised thousands of dollars for art therapy at Lurie Children's Hospital. Why is this important to you? So the Adam, my brother, who is my transplant donor, he came to me and said, I, I would really like to start a foundation. Um, initially, he wanted to raise money for cancer research, and then we thought – about um, how my entire career has been in education, mm -hmm. and that's something that I'm really passionate about. Uh, when I was as a reading interventionist, I had a student who was also receiving cancer therapies, and he was missing a lot of school, and so I was his reading intervention teacher. And I just remember thinking when I was working with him, um, I, I got to have like such a fun childhood. Yeah. I, I got to go on vacations and go to parties and you know, celebrate all the things without anything to worry about. And I would see him like missing lots of school and he was tired often. And I just thought it would be great to raise money for kids that were receiving cancer therapy and give them really positive experiences and fun experiences while they're in the hospital receiving those therapies. Mm -hmm. And so that's um, the foundation's called Mandy's Foundation. And it raises money for Lurie's Children's Hospital to provide positive experiences for children while they're hospitalized. So after everything, you, my dear, you never stopped fighting. You never stopped advocating for yourself. We talk about this all the time on Reset, but you know, many patients, they carry the weight of uh, making doctors listen to them and, and taking their health concerns seriously. Because this really can be a very lonely journey. And we also have to acknowledge that, you know, your case might be a little bit different. Not everyone has the resources to travel to different hospitals around the country, right? Right. Dr. Myers said that you made medical history. What impact do you hope your story has? Well, first, I want to make sure that people know about the DREAM program yeah. because it is really a one-of-a-kind program right now um, in the United States that is helping people that otherwise don't don't have another option and so what the doctors at northwestern are doing is really groundbreaking and i i want to spread that word i think it's also important for people to to know that they can advocate for themselves and unfortunately right now in the way things are set up is advocating for yourself is is probably the best option mm -hmm. and yes there are there are other um so groups, getting those second groups, and third opinions, right? Yeah, there are other groups that will advocate on your behalf or um, like 
programs that can advocate on your behalf, but I've always thought that like I am most important to me. And so I'm really proud of myself for making a lot of this happen Mm -hmm. and having the determination. And, and I think when people are sometimes told no, they take that as like the end all be all answer. And if I had done that, I wouldn't be here. And so exploring all options and, and just being determined and self-advocacy is really important. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. Me too. (laughs) So glad you're here. You haven't had to go through any more cancer treatment since your double lung transplant back in June. Is that right? Uh, Correct. No. How does that feel? You know, it feels a little surreal. Um, to be honest for the last seven years, I've, I've always been kind of wondering what's going to happen next, what treatment, what program. And so I'm really hopeful that I will stay cancer free and I'm trying to get into the mindset of this is my new life yeah. and and what opportunities are available to me now that I'm healthy. Speaking of opportunities, I hear <laughs> you are getting back into running. Yes. Incredible. I love to run. Um, prior to being sick, I, I ran all the time and it was a huge stress reliever for me. And so yeah. when you are receiving chemo, you don't have the energy to do that and at a period where I'm most stressed out, I couldn't do the thing that I really loved the most. And so I'm really just beyond happy to be able to run again. Look at that. Yeah. We've been talking to Mandy Wilk, who's a survivor of colorectal cancer and recipient of a life-saving double lung transplant surgery. Thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you for having me.